Okay, this morning we're going to talk about grace. And, uh, of course, Ephesians 2, 1 through 10 is pretty much the standard uh, proof text when we talk about grace. Uh, whoever talks about grace uh, usually starts off there. But uh, we've discussed the definitions of grace and such things, and I've given you some of my thoughts. And we ended up last week talking about the relationship between law and grace, how that... Uh, man, it's not within man that walks to direct his own footsteps, so God has given us his word, which is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto every good work. Uh, we know what we need to do to do what is right according to God. And in Titus 2, the grace of God has appeared to all people, everyone. Uh, hey, that's a blanket statement, isn't it? You watch when somebody makes an argument and says all or none, that pretty much takes away every bit of, uh, well, it helps to set the tone, helps you to understand what's being talked about, and, and we'll get more on that later on. But it's appeared to all people, and it teaches us, the grace of God teaches us certain things but it teaches us how to be the children of God. John 1, 17, of course, Jesus came. came uh, the Word became flesh, John 1, 14, but full of grace and truth. Not just grace, but grace and truth. And, and uh, when we talk about truth, now you're getting into something that discusses right procedures, right living. And 1 Peter 1, 22 and 23, uh, of course, we went over that. Uh, but what I come up with in my thoughts is that really the true opposite of grace is wrath. The opposite of grace is not law. Law defines grace, but we are either in a state of God's grace or we're in a state of his wrath. We'd much rather be in a state of his grace which means that we're in a right relationship with him. Now, I, I've given you some handouts last week to kind of look over. Don't worry about it. We're not going to get to them this week. Because as I was going back over the lesson, looking at it, I thought, maybe I ought to explain where this difference uh, between grace and law originates. Do you know? Probably not, right? So. It's good for us to just drop back, discover some things that's going on in the religious world around us to kind of understand why people would say, uh, we're not under law, we are under grace. That means we're not under any law. And of course, we looked at it, we said, you know, Paul was talking about the law of Moses, didn't he? And circumcision was the big issue in the first century, wasn't it? Uh, right after Christ died, the Jews, you know, said that the Gentiles had to be circumcised, become Jews before they could become Christians. And he's trying to tell them, no, there's a different law now that we are under. We're not under the law of Moses. We're under the grace of God, which, to what, what I say, you're talking about the, the, the New Testament. Because before they were looking forward to salvation, now we look back to the cross of Christ and understand that that's where our sins are forgiven. So, where, where do people come up with this? Well, <laughs> if law defines grace, and if wrath is the opposite of grace, where does the idea that law and grace are opposite and even incompatible come from? Well, I've got a quote up here. Wish Lance hadn't taken off is one of his favorite Wikipedia right here. <laughs> this is what Wikipedia says. Now, why do I ch why, why do I go to Wikipedia for some of this stuff? Because it gives you the general idea of what people are thinking. And, because, and if you know what Wikipedia Wikipedia is, you know they put something up there, but you can come in and you can convince them to change. So here's what most people say about. Dispensationalism. Notice it's got an ism there. All right? 
there's some there's a lot of truth right here about what's wrong in this uh, th this whole thing that we're talking about. Okay, listen to what it says. Dispensationalism is a religious interpretive system for the Bible. What does that mean? Yeah. In other words, we got this way of thinking, and then that's the way we're going to interpret what the Bible says. Instead of letting the Bible speak for itself, here's what we believe, and we're going to make everything in the Bible fit this. A religious interpretive system, and that's a dangerous thing, isn't it? When you're trying to find the truth of what the Bible says. Uh, it considers biblical history as divided deliberately by God into defined periods or ages to each of which God has allotted distinctive administrative principles. Administrative, what's an administrative principle? that govern your thoughts in this interpretive system. Now notice that they say here that, that, that what they say it's, it's divided deliberately by God. Well, if it was de deliberately divided up into these dispensations by God, wouldn't God have told us in his Bible, in his word? No, it's kind of like they pick this out. All right. Now, uh, what do you, I don't have up there. Listen to this. According to dispensationalist interpretation, each age of the plan of God is thus administered in a certain certain way, and humanity is held responsible as a steward during that time. Hey, well, we agree that those who are under the patriarchal law are going to be judged by the patriarchal law. Those who are under the law of Moses will be judged by the law of Moses. And we who are under the law of Christ will be judged by the law of Christ. But what happens if you say we're not under law, we're under grace? We're going to be judged by the grace of God. And all of a sudden, things change, don't they? Well... It doesn't really, but that's what they that that's the thinking you have to come to. But but what they say in each, and we're going to get to the seven of them, uh, each one, uh, God deals with people in different ways. Where we say there are three, we would say three dispensations or three covenants, they say there are seven dispensations. So uh, dispensationalists demonstrate the harmony of history as focusing on the glory of God and put God at its center as opposed to a central focus of man and humanity's need for salvation. Hmm. We like to put God at the center of things, don't we? Don't we? Yeah. But, but, but then again, isn't salvation because man needs salvation? Then Jesus come and die upon the cross so that we could be saved. saved. Right. So it, it, it's like we're going to take away everything about this. This is about man, and it's about saving man, and make it God's deal. That that God. Well, you will see it when we look a little bit further into Calvinism. That 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 God before. That he created the universe, decided that there were certain individuals who were going to be saved and certain individuals who were not. And it doesn't matter anything, whether they believe or whatever they do, it's just the way it is. All right? Now, uh, a couple notes that's there in Wikipedia. That was from Wikipedia. Okay? Not a good source. It, well, it's a general source which is good for us as a jumping off point and that's what I'm trying to express okay uh, but it, it 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 focuses on the glory of God and puts God at its center as opposed to a central focus on man and humanity's need for salvation 
where 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 do they separate? Uh, that's a question maybe that okay. Remember I told you that for the first few hundred years the church pretty much followed the New Testament and then once the church, the Roman Catholicism became the state religion, things began to change and in that it changed from God being the center to totally the opposite of man's needs okay and that's why you have what is it the seven sacraments as a works religion okay protestantism was a response to that no it's not about man god's sovereign so they develop this system totally over here and do away with any of man's responsibility but you, you're understanding me where the Bible says it's a cooperation that God created us, we fell, we need salvation, God has provided that, but we have to do something for us to be saved. The grace religion, so to speak, you can't do anything. You just can't because you're dead. You're dead in sin. You can't do anything. All right? So, uh, a dispens uh, this is a note, dispensational perspective of Scripture is evident in some early Jewish circles as seen in the Dead Sea Scrolls, like the community rule. And you could go and you could read that. Dead Sea scroll Scrolls, the Dead Sea Remember they found them at Qumran in the caves? That's like, there's a lot of writings there. They're not Scripture. But they tell you what people were thinking back in those days. And they had sort of a dispen a few of them had a, a, a view of dispensationalism, all right? So if we you go back and you grab hold of that and you bring it 1,600 years into the future and say, hey, we're going to make that our principle, that's not very good Bible study, is it? No, no. Okay, and the second note, early Christian fundamentalists, have you ever heard of fundamentalists? Okay. Embraced the system as a defense of the Bible against liberalism and modernism, and dispensationalism became the majority position within fundamentalism. Now, what is the greatest example of fundamentalism? Where does it express at its highest? United States, between 1900 and early 1930s, culminating pretty much in the Scopes <coughs> Monkey Trial. You've heard of that? Yeah, I've talked about that. Okay. You've heard about the Scopes Monkey Trial. The fundamentalist view was God has spoken, that's final. We don't want to hear any more. We don't want to hear any more. And even though the fundamentalists, so to speak, won the Scopes Monkey Trial, you see where it's led to, right? Now it's all about evolution and they're not talking about creativity as much. Right. At least in the textbook. Right. And basically what the fundamentalists were saying, well, we got the Bible, we believe it's true, and you're going to believe like we believe or we're going to punish you through the law. And then all of a sudden this thing's changing. Instead of, of fighting evolution and the modernism, on the basis of facts and proofs, they said, we don't have to prove anything. We just got the Bible, and there it is. Okay? So they won that, but they, they lost the war for a long time, didn't they? Now, now things are changing. <coughs> Notice that. Because uh, the uh, scholars, biblical scholars, number one, that they've gotten their, their faith back and talking about intelligent design as a fight against evolution it is really powerful so you see a, a growth in faith okay so understand it's dispensationalism is a religious interpretive system they said this is the template now you use this to determine what the Bible says Typical seven dispensation scheme 
is as follows, and you can find this just about everywhere. Number one, they, they break it down into an age of innocence, and that's from Adam to the fall. How long a period of time was that? We don't know, do we? We really don't know how long they existed in the Garden of Eden before the fall and were kicked out. But from the fall, see, God had this, you know, they were innocent. Now they've sinned, so boom, you got to change it to conscience. And that goes from the fall to the great flood, to the time of Noah. People just lived by their conscience. And of course, you see, it was a steady decline away from following God, except for a few in that lineage of Shem, the Shemites, the Semites, whom Noah was, Noah and Lamech and Methuselah and Enoch as you go backwards uh, in the genealogy. But an age of conscience. Then you have an age uh, or dispensation of human government, and that's after the great flood to the dispersion of the Tower of Babel. Okay, everybody was kind of together there, but it was human government. Human government failed, right? Right? Innocence failed, conscience failed, uh, human government failed. Then you have promise, and this is Abraham. Remember, Abraham comes along just right after the the, the Tower of Babel's destruction and people are driven out. And But there you have what they say is the dispensation of promise. It's about the promises of God. Abraham found faith because he believed what? Not that he believed God, but he believed the promises. Well, he believed God who made the promises, but the promises become the, the main point. Then you have uh, that was from Abraham to Moses, the law, okay, notice it doesn't say law of Moses. It's just law, this dispensation of law. From Moses to the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, you had law in the form of law of Moses. Wait a minute, weren't the Gentiles under law? We believe they were. We believe they were under the patriarchal law, right? Same as what uh, Noah was under, what Abraham was under. But then you have the dispensation of grace, and that is from the cross to... That's a different time. Where's the rapture of the church mentioned in the New Testament or in the Bible? It just isn't, right? It's not there. It'd be cross to when Jesus comes back again. Well, it's a template, again. And dispensation, dispensationalism has this template that also involves pre, what's called premillennialism. Okay? And we'll look at a little bit of that, too. Because this is all in, in trying to understand what these people, why they express things the way that they do. So, and that's what, here, that's why they say, we're not under law. That was a dispensation back then. We're under grace. We're under grace. God has just decided who's going to go to heaven and who's not, and there's nothing you can do about it. God will change you. God will do it all for you. You don't have to. You may not even know it. Okay? But then the seventh one is the millennial kingdom. And that's a thousand year reign of Christ. And listen, most of our brethren in the 1800s were millennialists. But they believed in a in post-millennialism. They thought that if they, especially the churches of Christ, because with the restoration movement, and you saw just boom, an explosion across the United States and in England and all, you know, basically all over the world, restoration, going back to New Testament principles, hey, we are ushering in a thousand years of peace, and at the end of that, Jesus is going to come back. Premillennialism teaches, now, Jesus will come back, he'll rapture his saints and leave bad people here, but the bad people are, most of them are going to be converted, and then uh, uh, he's, he's going to come, he's going to reign for, after seven years of tribulation, he's going to come and he's going to reign for a thousand years, 
And then, depending on if you're pre-trib or post-trib and all these things that are more templates that you put on it, uh, after the Battle of Armageddon, then you have judgment. Okay? Are you following me so far? This is why... So, when they talk about grace, we're under grace, we're not under all. Well, wait a minute. But Jesus said, he who believes and is baptized shall be saved. But we're under grace. <coughs> we're not under law. We don't have to take that as law. Okay? Now, I get down to a guy who believes in this stuff talking about this stuff, and we'll bring, just bring it all together. We'll get it all together before we leave the, 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 again to class this morning. So we'll know, uh, this is just not Wikipedia. This is one of their scholars, a man by the name of Dr. Thomas Ice. And the title of the, the essay or paper here, A Calvinistic Her Heritage of Dispensationalism. This ties the two together. I want to deal with dispensationalism now, show you how it ties with Calvinism so that when we get to just a, the brief, you know, like one Sunday, maybe two Sundays, kind of digging around in Calvinism, you know that they're kind of together on this, okay? Calvinism is another template. <coughs> so this is how you have to interpret the Bible, okay? Not just read from the Bible. Here's what it says, but this is what it means. So, he writes, and I've got the place where you can go on the internet to find this. I don't have, I don't think the whole article here, but you're free to, to investigate and make sure I'm telling you the truth, okay, of what they say. And, and what he writes, okay, got the quotation up here, modern systematic dispensationalism is approaching 200 years of expression and development. 200 years. Let's just say it was, this was written in 2000. That would be 1800. That wasn't very long ago, was that? So 200 years ago, now they're telling you this is how you have to understand the Bible. We live at a time in which dispensationalism and some of its ideas have been disseminated and adopted by various theological traditions. And that's what they would say, you know, we have a theological tradition that, that we try to go back to the scriptures, all right? They have theological traditions, whether it's coming out of Catholicism, whether it's uh, coming out of a brand of Protestantism, Calvinism, dispensationalism, premillennialism, see, that's their traditions, and they hold high uh, value, give high value to traditions. This is not surprising since our day is characterized by anti-systemization and eclecticism, eclectic system, system. <laughs> yeah. in the area of thought. Now, what is anti-systemization? No system, no law, which goes back to we are under grace, and not only under grace, whatever you think. And what is eclecticism? Eclectic is a gathering of thoughts. Okay. Maybe we won't get too much further than this today. What's the big thing in Christianity today? Non-denominationalism. Feel, feel good stuff. That's it. Yeah. Non-denominationalism. Well, I talked to a guy. He said, where do you preach? Oh, I preach over you know, well, you know, He lives in Panda. Well, I, I found a little church down here that's non-denominational. What does non-denominational mean? Supposedly they don't favor one religion over a group or another, right? Basically, is yes, they take from everything, okay? 
And if you go there, well, if you think you need to be baptized to be saved, they'll baptize you. If you don't, you don't have to. Just whatever you want goes. But if you look at it, their belief system then is really what? Based on Calvinism, premillennialism, and all of these things. So you got to be careful. Listen, we've been undenominational, not non-denominational, undenominational. It's what we're supposed to be. Just go back to what the Bible says. When you start denominating and put an ism here in front of it, that's where these different groups come from with their different ideas. And, and today it's just, oh, if you got an idea, do it. You know, whatever. Uh, you could have the, 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 the church of the lollipops and whatever. You know, just, we, oh, we believe in lollipops and we pass out lollipops. Or, you know, just pop the lollipops for the communion. You know. <laughs> All right. Let me see if I can, it's right at 11. Okay, let, let me just get through this. It may be surprising to some, this is still ice as he writes, to learn that dispensationalism was developed and spread during the first 100 years of those within a reformed Calvinistic tradition. There you go, tradition. It had only been, in the it had only been in the last 75 to 50 years, and I don't know why he states it that way. He's going backwards. We'd say 50 to 75. But 75 to 50 years that dispensationalism and some of its beliefs, it has its own set of beliefs, were disseminated in any situation <coughs> outside of the order of Calvinism. So Reformed, theolo Reformed th theology and I, I've talked to you, you had Catholicism, then you had a group that wanted to reform Catholicism. Okay? Karen grew up as a Methodist. In our early years, when we were dating, I'd go to church with her, I'd look in, in some of their books, like the Psalter that they had, and it put in there that they give something about the Holy Catholic Church. Methodists are not Protestants. They're still trying to reform the Holy Catholic Church. <coughs> right? Protestants, on the other hand, have protested against the Catholic Church, say Re Reformation didn't go far enough. And that's really where you get more into getting into the faith-based, uh, you know, faith-only, grace-only uh, tradition. Okay? Are you following? You got it? Okay. This is still ice writing. This is not to say that dispensationalism and Calvinism are synonymous. No, because they're, they're, it, it's two different systems that they kind of marry together and they still argue about it. They still argue about this stuff like pre trib, post trib. Premillennial, postmillennial, you find their writings. And he says, I merely contend that it is consistent with certain elements of Calvinism which provide a partial answer. Calvinism only provides a partial answer <coughs> as to why dispensationalism sprang from the Reformed womb. So, <coughs> dispensationalism comes from the reformed womb Calvinism drove more of the Protestant than what it did the reformed but then Pro uh, Calvinism kind of picks up with the dispensationalism to move forward with these new th do you see why the religious world is so divided? Why Christianity, as we call it, is so divided because of this that continues to go on. They cannot lay down their thought system, the Catholics, their works religion, the 
uh, reform, you know, their, their dispensationalism and, and such, the, the, the Protestants, their Calvinism, they can't lay it down and just pick up the Bible and see what the Bible says. What we've got to be very careful of is when these things are brought in, they're kind of accepted by the church. Listen, I know a lot of people in this area that listen faithfully to a radio station down in Wheeler that teaches this stuff. Okay? I don't say don't listen to it. What I say is be aware of what's being taught so that you'll know the difference between that and be able to pick up and, and know what the Bible says. Okay? All right. Do you have any questions? Does this help? Absolutely. Um, okay. That that's my key thing, and I thought, and that's why I did this instead of the handout. We'll try to do that handout next week. What is grace? That one guy's kind, of, and you'll see it then. Oh, it's all about it's all about God. It doesn't matter about man. It, it leaves us with nothing to do. So, thank you very much for your time and your attention. I appreciate it. Christ is